it's an absolute pleasure for, to have you on the Book Talk Hour, and I want to talk about stories of a street performer. Again, we have six-time Magician of the Year, Paul Payton, and former Vice President of the World Famous Magic Castle, sharing over 40 years of experiences in his book, Stories of a Street Performer. It's a classic tale and a must-read, and it's filled with vital lessons for the up-and-coming performer and life lessons that all can learn from. Whether you're, you're an aspiring performer, a fan of magicians, or a seeker of exciting stories, this is one book you will not be able to put down. Pop, please tell us about the book. Well, thank you very much. It's a very kind way of putting it. I am... Um, in this book, it's uh, uh, from a lecture that I did for magicians at the Magic Castle, and it tells the stories of when I worked on the street corners um, in the, the United States, in New York City, and uh, D.C., and other places, and in uh, Europe. And uh, what I learned from those experiences that, that that helped shape my career and that I and helped shape my life, really, and uh, what I thought was important and that some other people could learn from. And it's really filled with wonderful life lessons. And I, uh, the first thing, uh, you know, I did when I got this book is I read it completely through. I couldn't stop reading it because it was very inspiring and it's filled with wonderful stories. And tell us a little bit about how you got into magic. Well, I um, I started when I was about nine. Um, I've wasted the first eight years of my life kind of uh, drifting. But... Uh, <laughs> When I was about nine, I discovered I had this natural talent for uh, fraud and deception, and I was too lazy to work and too nervous to steal, so this was really the only thing open. <laughs> and and uh, uh, at what age did you find yourself really being able to perform comfortably in front of other magicians? Um, it was, well, in front of other magicians is, is, is a different story. I, I, I was working when I was 14. I was doing shows uh, for local. I, I was uh, born in Tennessee and uh, um, moved to North Carolina when I was nine. And when I was about 14, I, I was in Greenville, North Carolina. I was doing shows for, you know, the Optimist Club and local schools and things like that. And, and Pop, I'm sure you've been told this before. You have a bit of an accent. Is that a North Carolina accent? Well, it's a mixture. I, I like I said, my family's from Virginia, um, but I I was born in Tennessee and grew up in North Carolina, so it's kind of a, a mixed accent. And, and how is it? And, and how is it coming to California for the first time? Was it a little bit of culture shock? Well, uh, it was. Um, yeah, there was a lot of culture shock. You know, I'd been living in New York City and Washington D.C. for some time, so. <laughs> You know, uh, L.A. was quite different. Sure. Yeah. And, and I'm sure uh, during the times of the 60s, it was a, a very um, uh, energy-fueled time. Uh, many people were uh, uh, protesting the war, and, and there were a well, lot of individuals. Well that, was, who, 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 sure. well, that was a big part of how I got into doing magic full-time. I was, you know, I'd, I'd been in college and, and was doing magic, you know, for shows and stuff to help make some money, but... It, uh, I dropped out of college um, to face the draft. I, I, I was one of the first conscientious objectors from Pitt County, North Carolina. And uh, they sent me for um, alternative service in New York City at uh, New York uh, uh, University Hospital. And I started work there in inhalation therapy. And then um, when I was called, actually called for duty, I flunked the physical so I didn't have to do any alternative service, and then I was out of a job and in New York City. <laughs> so it's kind of like living now. Now I was in a kind of like a precarious situation, kid from North Carolina, you know, without a job in New York City. So um, I started doing magic on the street corners just to make money, and um, I, I discovered that, that by just taking out a deck of cards, I could make money just about any any time I wanted. On just on the streets of the city, and it was like a magic carpet. If I saw something, I, I, was, I was hungry. I could stand in front of a restaurant and do magic for an hour or two, and I'd have enough money to get something to eat. On a record, you know, I would go to the store and I'd do magic, you know, something for a little while. And after a couple of hours, I had enough to buy the album I wanted. It was like a magic Absolutely. carpet. That's that, that, and that's amazing. Onto itself, the ability to be able to go anywhere and be able to work and make money just with the skills that you possessed 
and, and a deck of playing cards. And, and well, that's it was very exciting. I, I, I traveled to Israel and to all over Europe and uh, England and Scotland and Wales and, and was able to travel and make my living just on what I could make performing as a street performer. But there's one 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 uh, story in particular within the book that that I that I would like you to uh, expound on a little bit, and it was about uh, Hyde Park. Can you talk talk a little bit about that? Oh, well, yeah, are you talking about the constables? Um, I, 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 when I first started in London to do some magic, I uh, I heard about Hyde Park as a place where people could get up and and talk about politics or anything they wanted to. I figured that'd be a good place to go busking and. Uh, so I, I went there and I started setting up shop and was doing a little magic and the uh, two policemen, two constables came over and they said, I have to stop. And I said, why is that? They said, well, um, busking is not allowed in Hyde Park. And, you know, performing for money is not allowed in Hyde Park. And I, I said, why not? They said, it's an offense to the queen. <laughs> and I go, well, how could she be offended? She hasn't even seen my act. <laughs> they didn't think that was very funny and they shooed me off and then I found out later from um, uh, a well known magician uh, Ken Brooks who had a magic shop in London he said that the only people allowed to perform on the streets in London were uh, vets you know, uh, disabled veterans and he right. said what you should do is find a disabled veteran to go uh, perform with so I went down to Penny Lane and I ran into this uh, old man, uh, Irish guy, uh, who was a one-man band and had disabled that. And he was, he had this contraption, you know, just like you'd see in a movie. Actually, he was in a movie. He was in a Peter Sellers movie, uh, <laughs> as background, with him playing and singing and cracking jokes. And he had the, you know, the cymbals and the drums and the flutes and the penny whistles and the, you know, uh, accordion and everything going at all at once. Everything going at once. Well, I, after he was performing, he was uh, really wonderful. After he finished, I, I told him I, I was a magician from the States. I needed mean, to work the streets. And it, you know, we could work it. He said, well, sure. And he turned around and drew a crowd. Before I knew it, he had a, a crowd around him. He was introducing me as his son, who had been in America. <laughs> and uh, I did some magic, and the crowd liked it, and they, they gave us some money. And he turned around and said, we're going to the Derby. And so the next day, he and I went to uh, the racetrack to the Derby races and worked the crowd there, and we made really, really good money. So we piled around together for a week or so in, in London and, and made money everywhere we went. That was my introduction to London. Now that's, a, that's a fantastic story, and, and there's one in particular that's one of the most inspiring passages that I've personally read in my life, and it's about when you performed magic for a visually impaired senior citizen. Can you tell us a little about uh, Well, it that? wasn't a senior citizen. It was a young lady. Um, oh, it was a young lady. She, she was 21 or 22. Uh, her name was Linda. And her husband were with her mom and dad. She was uh, blind from birth. She was completely blind from birth. Um, well, the story goes that uh, I was working at a Marie Callender's restaurant in Long Beach, and, and I, I, I came in to, up to a table to do some magic. Um, and... Uh, I asked the people, hey, would you like to see some magic? And they said, oh, yes, that would be wonderful. And so I turned to the uh, older lady, and I had her pick a card. And then I turned to the younger lady and said, would you pick a card? And she doesn't move, respond at all. I said, would you pick a card? And suddenly she uh, goes, oh, I'm sorry, are you talking to me? And I went, yes. And she goes, oh, I'm sorry, I'm blind. And that's when I realized that uh, there was a... There was a seeing eye dog sitting at the, <laughs> at her foot, and she was actually uh, legally blind. And when I, she was completely blind, and from birth. So I said, "Well, you know, this is not going to do a whole lot for you, but um, um, I will finish this trick, and it will do something special, just you and I." And um, when I came back to her, I did a trick uh, in which she actually became the uh, the performer, and she. She was the one that it looked like she had ESP. I had her, uh, I would hold up, up a card and she had her name of red or black, and she could, couldn't see anything, but, you know, the back of the card was to her. And she would call it red. She would call one black, red, red, black, black, and every time she was right. And uh, <laughs> then she named the number of the card, and her mother just about had a cow. Her mother was just, you know, <laughs> she, she made a little <laughs> squeamish thing. <laughs> and uh, she she finally uh, named the exact card that I was holding in my hand. 
and uh, she, uh, she she and I had gotten in cahoots somehow without I can't tell you the exact <laughs> method, but without ever having met her before in front of her mom and dad, we we, we kind of like established a, a way of communicating. She was able, to, I was able to signal her what the cards were, and she of course didn't want to tell because it made her look like she had really SP. So about a week later, I got a. Um, uh, a package in the mail, and it was a set of Braille playing cards and a note from her saying, my husband and my mom and dad are still scared of me. It was the best <laughs> night of my life. And here's some Braille playing cards. If you run into another blind person, maybe you can do something with these. Well, that's a fantastic story, and I, I think it's one of the most inspiring uh, passages that I've ever read, and it's it's just wonderful how you were able to well, perform actually, magic. Book, we, we we tell the method too. <laughs> it's an interesting <laughs> it's an interesting trick. We actually tell that trick. There's only two tricks that I reveal. Um, one of them is that one. The other one is one uh, a little scam I did a, where I used ESP on the street corner when I couldn't. It was too cold for me to work outside and perform because of my fingers. Or the cops were the too many cops looking for me, trying to stop me from performing. I would do what's called the ESP survey, in which people, as they were walking by, just ask them, "Do you believe in ESP? Do you believe in ESP?" <laughs> when somebody stopped, it was because they were interested, and they go, "What are you doing?" I go, "Well, I'm doing an experiment, an extrasensory perception." And I take out a business card and write a number down on it and say, "Name a, a three-digit number." He'd say, "Like three two seven." I'd hand him the card, and it would have 327 written on it. And I'd say, you got any change you can spare for my research? <laughs> well, <laughs> it was always worth at least five bucks, and, and sometimes it would get me a, a, a free dinner, or I would be brought to, uh, I, I once went with a professor to his classroom and gave a lecture on ESP. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's very interesting. And again, we're talking about uh, stories of a street performer by Whip Pop Hayden. It's in stores now. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it at Roman's Bookstore in Pasadena. You can get it at the Magic Apple Magic Store in North Hollywood, California. Um, you can order it online. It's about um, 40 years of Pop's 40 years of uh, experiences performing magic all around the world. It's a classic tale and a must-read for everyone, and it's filled with vital lessons for the up-and-coming performer. And and Pop, I want to thank you very much for coming on the show, and it's been well, a great pleasure. It's been my pleasure, Combies. It's always a pleasure talking with you. Thank you, sir, and you have a beautiful night. Uh, you as well. Bye bye. And that was Mr. Pop Hayden, six-time Magician of the Year. <laughs> <laughs> 